And we've got um, Jimmy Sizemore is going to be giving this presentation on the American chestnut and at this Kentucky Woodland owner update. So, um, Jimmy, so glad you're doing this. I know you're a part of the American Chestnut Foundation itself. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. And I'll tell you, I, I really welcome the uh, the opportunity to uh, to give the presentation tonight. Uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier, I've got a little disclaimer I'm going to start with, and that is that, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a forester. And, uh, you know, all the information that you that you will uh, will see in this presentation tonight, you know, I've gleaned that because I, I do a lot of reading and, um, you know, some of that is just from from uh, there's a couple books I'm going to mention. I, you know, I, I, I read quite a bit, uh, but also, you know, there are there are some uh, uh, National Park Service uh, uh, circulars out and and uh, uh, as, as well as the uh, the um, uh, National Forest so or National Forest Service and you know I, I've read a lot of information and then I, I do belong to the American Chestnut Foundation and you know they do their chestnut chat and then also on their web page there is all kinds of information on on there so you know the information that you're getting right now you know all these photos and, and basically you, you you can find someplace on the uh, on the internet, that's that's mostly mostly what I did. I have no idea where some of them came from because I've I've had them so long. But really, again, you know, I'm I'm really not anyone that is uh, schooled in this kind of thing. I uh, you know basically what what I am is uh, you know I, I'm I'm a guy that uh, you know his his grandfather and his and his father uh, you know gave him a, him an appreciation for um, for the American chestnut, and so uh, that's. Uh, that's that's really where I'm coming from on this. So without you know anything further, um, I'd like to get right into the presentation. Uh, you know the American chestnut. Uh, you know, the presentation I'm going to give. You know it says past, present, and future, and that's really how I've, I've broken down the uh, the presentation tonight. So you feel advanced for me? Not yet, Jimmy. Yeah, I know I. Hey, click it again, Jimmy. Click the screen. You might have to make it the active window. Okay. Well, yep. And now see if it'll go. There we go. Okay. So let's let's start with the with the past now. You know, the American chestnut truly it was a giant of the of the forest. And you may hear hear it sometimes called the redwood of the east. Well, you know, here's a picture of, of some. American chestnuts and see the the uh, lumberjack there and and you know, I've, I've heard I don't know where this came from but they said you know you've got this six foot lumberjack so that'll kind of give you a comparison of how big these trees actually were now the world record as I've noted American chestnut uh, was in um, was located in the Smoky Mountains in 1942 and it had a circumference of 27 and a half foot now if you want to compare that to the redwoods uh, you know, I think the largest redwood is about 40, 40 point six, I think, feet in circumference. And there are literally hundreds of them that would be 25 foot in circumference. Um, it doesn't say in, in here exactly how tall this was, but we do know that, that many of the American chestnuts did exceed, um, you know, 100 foot. Uh, again, in comparison, you know, the, the redwoods uh, of the West Coast there, I mean, you're, you're looking at, at a tree that will, <laughs> will definitely be much higher. Uh, I, I, I remember seeing something about, you know, one that was 250 some foot tall. So it, uh, again, in, in comparison, you know, uh, to our woods, certainly they, these trees were giants though. And I remember my grandfather talking to me about some, you know, and how large they really were. And then my father, he saw more of what he would refer to as the, you know, the, the white gold standing on the mountain. But he also talked to me about the stumps that were left and how, as a even as a teenager, he could still lay on those stumps and uh, you know feet to you know head you know feet to head and uh, and not and not uh, not entirely uh, cover the stump. So these were some large trees. Uh, the natural range you can see of the American chestnut was uh, was pretty large. You know it stretched from all the way up in Maine into Georgia. And I've also seen you know where uh, there are some that will say, well, you know it it went it went much further down. You know uh, in in Mississippi and Alabama. And um, the, the reality is that before this, this map probably was first generated, uh, there were chestnuts that were much further south, uh, but Phytophthora had, uh, had already, before, before we started losing them to the blight, 
uh, had already taken out probably a significant number of these in their range. And, and we, we really know that by, uh, by deeds where these trees were often used as witness or corner trees, if, if you would. I think the, the important thing about this slide uh, for us in Kentucky is look how much of Kentucky was prime American chestnut uh, territory, a huge, a huge part of it. Uh, and in fact, where these trees were growing, they constituted a fourth to a half of the canopy trees. Imagine that, imagine that more than 25% in some, in some areas where they were dominant, that exceeded 50% now. Uh, what, what tree, you know, is most common in, in the woods today? Red maple, I think, you know, you could, you could use that maybe as a comparison, but nothing, nothing that's going to be, you know, a large canopy tree like that. And the core of the core of the range was right here in the in the Appalachians, and I believe that's that's actually something from uh, from someplace over in North Carolina. The picture. Now, taking taking a look back in in uh, you know some of the historical references for the American chestnut right here, and uh, some of the, some of the mention that was made of it very very early on. You know, in nineteen or I'm sorry, in in fourteen and ninety two, there's four billion American chestnuts in America. There was around 5 million native people living here. That's, that's quite a comparison, I think. The Native Americans certainly use this resource. We, uh, you know, we have evidence where they, they you know, use them for canoes, but they use them as, as uh, coverings for their homes, both in the roof and on the sides, and they use them for medicine as well. Um, Hernando de Soto's chronicler in 15 and 40 states, where there be mountains, there be chestnuts. Chestnut was, was something that they knew from Europe and, and they recognized them and said they were abundant here. Governor Bradford in, in Pennsylvania, uh, he said, you know, was talking about the kinds of trees and the, and, the, and the timber that was there. And notice that he mentions that the chestnuts are exceedingly great, exceedingly great. Another very common, large and valuable tree is what Gifford Pinchot uh, stated about it. And notice he says it reaches heights of 120 feet and 13 feet across. So again, there's, uh, there's plenty of evidence for how big they were. The American chestnut was certainly an important tree you know, in early America. And look, it accounted for 25% of all hardwood lumber cut in Southern Appalachia. Now, the, the tree was one of the best for timber. There's no doubt about it. Uh, for one thing, you know, growing in the forest there, it grew so, so straight and often you would go 50 foot or more before you even come to that first branch. You know, my dad and I were out looking at some large poplar trees and dad would say, son, that's got two or three logs in it. When I think about a chestnut, 50 foot before you hit your first limb. And the thing about it, you know, chestnut, uh, like poplar, is a very, very fast growing tree, very fast growing. And so the grain is, is extremely straight. And it's very light. It's much lighter than oak. It's, it's certainly a lot easier work. And chestnut, like the redwood, was, uh, was rot resistant. It, they said that it was actually as rot resistant as, as redwood. And because of that, this wood was used for virtually everything. You can see in some of the pictures there. Yeah, we all know about, you know, the, the log homes and many of the log homes. I actually moved the log home and it was made of chestnut. I did that in, in 1980 and it was solid. We've all, you know, seen the, uh, the fences in pictures, and we may have actually seen some. I have a friend that, that likes to go out in the mountains and collect some of these old rails from the, uh, from the fences. So you had that, and then they made shingles, but they were also used for utility poles, railroad ties, and they were used for furniture. Matter of fact, one of the, one of the favorite sayings of many, uh, many uh, that are in the organization is it was the cradle to grave tree because they made cradles out of chestnut and they also made coffins out of chestnut. Uh, certainly because it was so plentiful, uh, they, used, they used the pulp, you know, uh, for uh, in the uh, paper factories. And it says in the South, I, you know, I read that, that um, they used the bark and the wood for tannin extraction, you know, to, to tan leather. But I know that this was also a common practice in, in, uh, in the Northeast as well. Chestnut was also an extremely important commodity for, uh, for many of the settlers in, in Appalachia. The nuts, and, and they were plentiful. You know, people ate the nuts, but uh, the wildlife certainly depended on, on, this, uh, on this tree for, uh, for food. 
and uh, and and also people fatten their hogs. You know, I remember my grandfather talking to me about that. You know how the hogs would run wild in the uh, in the woods, and they would fatten on the chestnuts. There are even even if you look in Foxfire, you'll find uh, references to to how the hams from the hogs that were uh, you know that were were uh, free ranging on the chestnuts. They just taste it better. They said you know they were they were a very high high cost commodity. Um, a mature chestnut tree, and I get this, this is fact, reliably produced as many as 6,000 nuts per tree each year. Now, in contrast, a white oak, you know, you're going to get about 1,000 a, a nuts per tree. Red oak, 2,000. And, and note also that a redwood, you're, or a red oak, you're not going to get nuts every year from, from that tree either. Uh, neither family of the oaks produces acorns reliably. Again, something that my, my father and grandfather often talked about. They said, you know, the chestnuts you could depend on for mass every single year. The oaks, you know, they're cyclic. You know, you just don't get, get that. Maybe every three to five years, you're gonna have a heavy oak crop, but the chestnut, it was an annual event. <clears throat> and, you know, the chestnuts were also one of the four main cash crops, they say, here in Appalachia. Chestnuts were right up at the top and then you had hogs and how did the hogs feed or, or how did they fatten on the chestnuts? And then we had apples and of course, and of course, moonshine. Now, when we lost the chestnuts, we lost a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the income from those, not just because, you know, people sold a lot of hogs that were fattened on chestnuts, but also because the chestnuts were used to barter in stores. The, the people in the, uh, in the mountains often collected them in, in, as my grandfather would say, coffee sacks full, and then took them down and they sold them. And you can find records where they exported <clears throat> loads of these nuts to the cities. Now, here's some stuff real close to home, especially for you that are over there in central Kentucky. This is a, an actual newspaper article that uh, came from the Scottsville Argus. I have no idea if this, if this paper is still, uh, still in circulation. I've, I've never seen it. I just saw this uh, historical document. Uh, but that's over you know, in Allen County, Kentucky. Uh, this tree that was cut down by Mr. Reed, uh, it, it, according to the article, it was nine feet across at the base. I, so I take it that's probably the stump. And he obtained six cuts from that tree. So he cut out six logs and he got 700 rails, according to the article. Mr. Reed, it was said, counted the pores, that is the rings of the tree. And he figured that that tree was over 230 years old. Now here's a few other articles from that Allen from Allen County. The one in the far left, if you look at it, it talks about undertakers. Uh, they're advertising the type of coffins they have, and note that one of the most popular is chestnut on there. Uh, another article there uh, from Allen County again uh, is from the telephone company, and they want chestnut poles. Um, another one is buying chestnut cordwood right there. So, you know, people, people cut a lot of wood um, and, they, uh, and they sold a lot of wood, a lot of poles, a lot of railroad ties. So again, when they <coughs> lost the chestnut, they lost a very, very important source of income. That all started happening in 1904. That's when the, the blight was first detected. That's not when it first entered in this country. We, we, we now have traced it back and and are pretty, pretty certain that it came in to, uh, to the United States around 18 and 76, but um, they had imported some trees, you know, to, to the zoo there in, uh, in New York, uh, like, like we do, you know, we'll, we'll import all these, all these trees from, from other locations. And uh, so they, they had imported these trees and they noticed that the chestnuts were dying. And so eventually they actually, the, the, the guy, the caretaker there, the gardener, he appealed to the USDA to see if they could come in. They came in and after a very short time, they determined that, yeah, it was, it was actually a fungus that was killing these trees. And so they started to try to eradicate uh, the, uh, the fungus. They, they, uh, they were obviously totally unsuccessful. I mean, they cut, they cut miles and miles uh, around, you know, where they would find a, an infested grove of chestnuts but were never able to, uh, to stop the spread of it. And the reason they couldn't stop the spread is because of the way it spreads, you know. 
it, it, it was spreading, you know, animals were spreading it, birds were spreading it. So really it was just, it was just an, an, an impossibility. So in, in less than 50 years, in less than 50 years, the chestnut had been effectively wiped out. Uh, right here's the map and, and the map shows the progression, you know, from 1904 there in New York to 1910, 1920, 1930. The map shows that by 1930, it's already, it's already in Kentucky. And by 1950, it had wiped everything out. Now, my dad was born in 1935. He remembers still, still a few live chestnuts. My grandfather, though, was born in 1910, and chestnuts were a very big thing, you know, for, for them growing up. Here's a picture from Pine Mountain and those, those large trees that you note right there, those are dead chestnut trees. Now, interestingly enough, you know, at, on Pine Mountain, um, you can find live chestnuts right now. If you go to the lodge there, I was sitting in the, uh, in the restaurant there with some fellow members of the uh, Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. We were having lunch and we looked out the window and you could see some sourwood blooming. But we noticed that not everything out there blooming was sourwood. And right from that window, there was a large blooming American chestnut. Now I went back later and, and investigated and I found several of them right there, just right outside the, uh, the lodge. And the one that was, that was large enough to bear, there were actually probably two of them at that time. Uh, one that, that definitely had burrs that year, but none of the, I, I wouldn't collect at the, uh, uh, the burrs, and I, I didn't find any uh, viable nuts in them. And that's, that's part of the challenge with the, uh, with the chestnut. You know, when you do find one that perhaps is blooming, oftentimes there is not one close enough to cross-pollinate that tree. And so that's why, you know, it, you, you just don't have any luck. Uh, now, let's, 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 let's start with to present. Let's talk about that. There are still a few large surviving chestnut trees around. Uh, now, these trees somehow escaped the blight. How did they do it? You know, are they um, survivor trees, if, if you would? Well, yeah, they are survivor trees. But what is it that makes them survivors? Well, we're not certain in all cases. Uh, in, um, in 2001, uh, the, uh, there was a, a large tree, which is still there, uh, in Adair County. Uh, and uh, that's what really started the American Chestnut Foundation, the chapter here, here in Kentucky, was the discovery of that, of that tree. Now, you see another picture of a much larger American chestnut, much larger, and that's in California. Uh, you, you notice that's in the, in the uh, lower um, left-hand corner, and it's sitting right next to a home. What happened was, as settlers uh, moved further west, they often took nuts with them and they planted them. And the blight didn't make it west of the Rockies. And because of that, you have some very large trees. Also in Michigan and up in Wisconsin, there are still a few large ones. I think probably one of the largest, um, not a wild one, but is, is, are those that are out in California though. Now these large trees that we find right now, we refer to these a lot of times as, as mother trees, and we use those in research. We use them in the breeding programs. That Adair County tree right there, there's no tree close enough to, uh, to cross pollinate with that tree. So what we do is we bring pollen to that tree and we pollinate it. And then we will collect pollen from that tree and take it to other existing American chestnuts that are blooming. And that's how we, uh, how we actually are able to get nuts from the trees. Now there is a very large one, the, the largest one that we know of in, in Lovell, Maine right now. Um, it's 115 foot tall. We've estimated that it's probably a hundred years old. And the, the really neat thing about this tree is, is this tree was discovered because it was blooming and they just happened to be flying over and someone noticed it. Uh, so that's, that is one of, the, one of the ways that we are finding a lot of these trees. Now, this tree was found sometime in the last, I think, the last five years. I think, matter of fact, I'm, I'm thinking it was probably 2016, 2017, when this tree was discovered in Maine. So they're out there. Today, though, if you happen on a large uh, American chestnut, it's likely going to be like this right here. It's, it's the stump of a dead one. 
Uh, this one you can still see, at least as, uh, as of this past year in the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, about three weeks ago, I went to take a look at this tree. I've been by a few large ones there in the Smokies. And uh, I always said, hey, is, is that, you know, a lot of times we're hiking in, in, um, in January uh, there. But um, you know, I said, hey, is, is, is that an American chestnut? I believe it is, you know, but I, I didn't see any around it that I could definitely confirm were. But uh, this one actually was found on the, uh, I saw, found this picture. Uh, this is a guy that uh, was president at that time of the, uh, the Tennessee chapter. And they've actually got a map of uh, those that you can find. I was by one just the other day on the Ramsey Falls uh, trail uh, there. So there, there are several of them, but usually that's, that's what you're gonna locate. The American chestnut does exist today though, largely as clonal understory trees. The first one that I saw was at Fort Knox. Uh, they had done some clearing there and uh, the uh, chapter went out and looked and, and, and sure enough, I found one of them. And I was thrilled, I have to admit. And you know, it, it's kind of like buying a car. Once you buy that car, you know, and, and you think there's no other ones out there, suddenly you'll start seeing them all over the place. Well, I have, I have chestnuts on my property and my father and I, we walked one day seven miles in, in, the, in the woods and we couldn't find a single one. It was in winter. And the, the next year, an uncle and I, we went looking and we found some. And sure enough, just like in this picture right here, you could see the, the blighted stump of one that was about 15 foot tall and grow, growing right next to it were all of these little, uh, little sprouts. And it does, it does sprout prolifically. Um, but the, the problem again is that most of those, most of those, they don't, um, they don't make it. Uh, if, you, if you hike much at all, you will absolutely uh, see these sprouts. Uh, shortly after, after I found those on my property, I was hiking with, uh, with my son-in-law and, and grandkids, and we were over outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, we had walked, he found this trail on all trails, and it was at, at the Bear Waller Mountain or something, and we're hiking along, and I said, hey, that's an American chestnut. So I started tree snapping it, and I went another 25 foot down the trail, and I'm, I, well, there's another one, so I'm tree snapping that one. And one of the, one of the, um, uh, other people that was in the hiking party there, he, he was a, just a friend of my, of my son-in-law's. He got really interested in it. You know, he said, what is that? You know, it's American. And so we're going along. And finally, though, I had to quit tree snapping because I was holding everyone up. I mean, they were all over the place there. And most of them, most of them were 10 foot or less tall. Um, also, if American you ever uh, go out to, uh, uh, you know, Cumberland Gap right there and you hike up to Hensley Settlement, You'll find them all along that trail as well. So they're out there. They're out there. Um, but the problem again is they're not able to reproduce. No. Another place that you can find American chestnuts today are in um, in some of the germplasm conservation orchards. The picture that you see is is ours right there. Wow, that went back on me. Let me see if I can get it to go back. Up. Uh, Okay, yeah, that picture right there is right is in Richmond. We planted about 1,200 trees there back in 2016, and uh, there's there's a lot more than that now. Some of them some of them have uh, have succumbed to the to the to the blight. You will find American pure Americans here, and you'll also find some that um, are back crosses, and we'll we'll talk about that just a little bit in in, in a little while. Some that we that we have from uh, from other uh, uh, you know other programs, but but you can, you can find those Justin. right there. You and you can certainly go out there. There is a gate uh, because that that area right there it, it's got a huge fence around it. You can see that over to the left. We had to do that for the deer, but um, uh, you know it, it is gated because there are cattle in there. But you can certainly go out there and and see those. Matter of fact, they have volunteer days where if you want to come out and you know kind of help us weed and and, and whatever. Uh, there's actually someone there that, that mows that for us. So they do a great job at EKU of, uh, of helping us take care of those trees. Uh, so the, you know, the, certainly the, the organization that is leading the restoration effort is the American Chestnut Foundation, but they work with a lot of others, certainly universities, but also the National Park Service and the National Forest Service. And you know, our goal again is, is to try to restore this, this uh, this tree to our eastern woodlands, you know, to benefit the environment, 
our wildlife and certainly our society as well. So, you know, the, the American Chestnut Foundation, when you hear me talk about that, you know, we have a headquarters that is in Asheville, North Carolina, but there are 16 different state chapters and they're really, they're really doing a lot of this work. There's also, uh, if, you, if you go over to uh, Virginia right there, just a short distance off of 81 is the Meadowview uh, uh, Research Farm. Uh, you know, that, that has been in operation and that's where a lot of the, uh, the trees and the back, crest, uh, the back cross program uh, where, where we're doing all of that right there is it, is it, is it Meadowview. That's just just by uh, Abington. Again, you'll 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 see Abington right off of 81 there. So uh, in 2001, that's like I said, that's when we formed our chapter. And that uh, that truck right there, uh, uh, you know, that is is actually helping pollinate. That's what that's what it was about. They were helping pollinate that tree. So the American Chestnut Foundation, you know, they have multiple pathways. Uh, and you know, when I joined in 2000, basically it was all it was all the back the back cross program. There was some talk about you know the uh, the the bio control, but everything was basically that. However, today you know the theme uh, is is what they refer to as the three burr science protocol. So we're we're doing breeding, uh, biotechnology, and then biocontrol, and all that's united for restoration so that's that's kind of you know there are normally three burrs or, or three three i'm sorry three nuts in a burr so that's where the, that's where they're getting that from so first let's talk about the back cross breeding now you know they they've used this for years you know you you find a uh, a plant that has particular trait and you and you back cross that back so that uh, that desirable trait is uh uh, you know, is, is passed on. I do that in my honeybees. You know, we do it. We do it in plants. And so, you know, the goal of this back cross program is to uh, instill that blight tolerance. So here's how it works. And you, you'd have to look at this chart for a long time, but uh, you know, I'll just quickly explain it. So you take a, a Chinese tree that has the has the tolerance, obviously, and you back cross that, or you cross that with a uh, with an American, and then you take the offspring of, of those, so you're collecting the nuts and you're growing these little trees out, and that is your first or your F1. It's your first cross that you've made with that. And then once you once you grow those out, you look at those trees and you you select for what for what uh, you know the desirable characteristic. And so you know the two main things are we want a tree that is timber like because that's what the American chestnut is. So you look at that tree and you're you're considering the morphology basically. You're saying, okay, does this tree look like one that's going to go straight and tall? Does it have American chestnut leaves? Does it look like it's an American? And then more importantly, then once you do that, you say, okay, now, if I inoculate this with the blight, will it survive? And so some of those will survive because they have inherited some of the traits from the Chinese. So those that survive, then you back cross those with another American. So that's your first back cross. You back cross those with that with another American. So now you're going to get a tree that is more American, but hopefully it has some of that uh, tolerance. And so you continue to do that for for a few generations. And finally, after about 35 years, you come up with a tree that is mostly American, but has a lot of tolerance. Now we say it's 15 16 American. And so it, it, it has inherited about 94% is what on average we say, 94% of the American genes, but it has inherited enough of the, of, the, uh, of the Asian genes that it has tolerance. I didn't say it was resistant, but it has tolerance. And so those trees that you hear about, we sometimes they were called restoration chestnuts or 15, 16th chestnuts. About 40% of those trees have uh, have moderate to high tolerance to the blight. So if you get those those, you're not going to to get a tree that is you know 100 uh, percent resistant to, or or tolerant of the blight. As a matter of fact, when we started the back cross program, uh, it was believed that there was probably you know two or three genes in the Asians that were responsible for in you know for that resistance. 
but now we know that it's nine. That's what, but you know, I, I read something about two weeks ago that said now they think that it might be more like 12. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it take a long time to completely, uh, you know, breed, breed, you know, just through the back cross breeding to breed a tree that was as, as, as highly resistant as the, as the Asians are. So then we go to biotechnology. And this has been in the news a lot lately, a lot. Um, you know, the, uh, the uh, national headquarters in cooperation with what they refer to as, as, as SUNY or the State University of New York, the Department of Environmental Science and Forestry, they, they have engineered, genetically engineered a, uh, an American chestnut tree. Now, but they refer to this as a transgenic tree because it has a gene from another plant species. And so what they've done is they have, they have taken the oxalate oxidase uh, from the wheat plant and they have inserted it into, into a germ cell, the American chestnut. Uh, now, that, that tree is, well, you know, some people will say 99.99% American. It is truly 100% American, but it has this extra, extra gene, if you would, add it to it. Now you you really couldn't call this a 100% pure American, I guess, because it because it has that. But truly, that tree is American as uh, as as you're going to get, except it has that that other gene added to it, and that gives it that gives it uh, tolerance to to the blight, but a much higher tolerance. What happens with oxalate oxidase is that the fungus that infects the American chestnut. That fungus, um, when it gets under the bark of the tree, it, it produces oxalic acid, basically, and that dissolves the tissue of the tree. Well, this oxalate oxidase, it neutralizes that. It doesn't kill the fungus, so it's not a, it's not a pesticide, but it, it neutralizes it and it prevents it from continuing to spread in the tree. And so what you end up with is a wound on the tree, but it doesn't kill the tree. Now, before this tree can ever, you know, go out into the environment, be released, there are three government agencies that have to approve this tree or deregulate it. So far, uh, you know, the, the uh, petition that, that, you know, that we know most about is the one that was to the uh, USDA, uh, and that has gone through the, um, uh, going, it's going through the process. And if, if they, they okay, the, okay it uh, to be, de if they decide to deregulate it, uh, then, you know, within three to five years, we could actually have these trees available. So, you know, that, and that's just one step though. Uh, the, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency also has to look at it. The Food and Drug Administration, because this is a food, you know, this produce, they have to look at this as well. And I'll tell you, the, the research that they have gone that they have gone through to um, uh, you know to test this tree. I mean, they they tested leaf litter to see if you know any aquatic life or anything that would feed on that on the forest floor if it would be adversely affected. Um, you know, I, again, there's a lot a lot more about that that uh, that I really don't have time to go into, and, and I'm and I'm not really the guy to guy to to uh, to uh, get the information from anyway. But the the uh, the website you know of the American Chestnut Foundation they have. A lot of information on that if you're if you're interested in that, and then of course we have the biocontrol. And I have to admit I've always been drawn to this. Uh, hypovirulence is what it's referred to, and it has controlled chestnut blight in in some locations in Europe. You know the the, the blight actually got to Europe from America, amazingly enough. And when when they started losing the European chestnuts. After a very short time, they realized that some of these were recovering. And so we started investigating and discovered that it is a virus that is making the fungus sick. And so, again, it, it weakens it, if you would, and, uh, and it doesn't allow for the spread. We also discovered the same thing in Michigan. And then we attempted to, uh, to move some of this virus, if you would to trees in, in Wisconsin, we discovered that it doesn't spread very well. You know, I mean, you think of a virus as spreading, the, the expression is it spreads like a virus, you know, spreading easily, but it isn't that easy. And one of the reasons it isn't so easy 
is because there are 64 different, at least that we know of, different variants of the, uh, of the Cryponectra parasitica uh, fungus. And so what we've now done, though, scientists, uh, they have developed a, a super donor hypovirus that they can infect the, uh, the, uh, the fungus with. And, uh, and, it, and it does show some, some, uh, some promise. I think that the neatest thing about the, the biocontrol is what Robert Frost said, you know, in, in his little poem, this little short poem that, that, that he penned, you know, uh, more than a hundred years ago now, or, or not, not quite a hundred years ago, but he said, will the blight in the chestnut? The farmer's rather guess not. It keeps smoldering at the roots and sending up new shoots till another parasite shall come to end the blight. I, I, you know, it's almost prophetic. You know, I, I really think that's neat. So what is the future of our American chestnut? Well, without a doubt, a new day is dawning for the American chestnut. And, you know, I think when I say that, I, I, I need to point this out. You know, success is not one perfect tree. This picture right here comes from a, a, a slide that uh, they actually got from, um, uh, from, um, uh, from EKU. Uh, and, and, you know, we had, they had used this in, in one of their presentations there. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it states that, you know, what we're, we're not looking for that perfect tree, that one perfect tree. And by the way, those um, transgenic trees, you know, that's referred to as the Darlin 58 or the Darlin 54, the earliest one. And that tree is a clone. But when we, when we uh, if and when, you know, it is deregulated, what they will do is they will cross that tree with others, uh, you know, pure Americans, and the offspring of those trees will then possess 50% of the uh, uh, of that pure American from that tree. And inc incidentally, only only 50% of those trees will be transgenic because it will only be it will only transfer to those. So the rest of those will be pure American still with no transgenic um, you know genes at all in them. So what we're looking for is a population of trees that can actually reach maturity and reproduce. Notice in the, in the photo, all the different, you know, af, alphanumeric designations for those trees. You know, those are, are based on um, the source of the tree, basically. So we're, we're not trying to just rescue a single tree, but a very diverse species. And restoration is really a multi-generational, uh, you know, effort. So how long is it going to take to restore the American chestnut? Well, this was in one of the, the most recent chestnut chats, and it said it could take 2,300 years to restore the American chestnut. Now, those of us that are woodland owners, I mean, you know, we know we're in it for the long run, but 2,300 years, and that would just take it to 1% of its, its pre-blight range. Now, when I heard that, I thought, so how are they doing the math? So interestingly enough, they had a slide that talked about how they had come to this. And when I say they, actually, this is uh, Sarah uh, Fitzsimmons, and she is the, the uh, person at, at uh, TAP that is in charge primarily of the, of the restoration effort. That's her, that's her lane, if you would. And so here's how she did that. Now, assume that we're trying to replace the American chestnut at 1% of the U.S. hardwood production, which is what poplar is, basically. If the goal would be to plant 220,000 trees per year at a rate of, let's say, 550 trees per acre, that would be the equivalent of 431 acres per year to get to that 220,000 trees. That would plant back 1% or 1 million acres. Now, that would be a year. So what would it take? It would take. 2,320 years to, to achieve that because the American chestnut once occupied 200 million acres here in Appalachia. And of course, Sarah also had this to say. She said, now please note that this slide is making a lot of assumptions. The 1% again is based on the production of tulip poplar, which is another very fast growing species. And, and then since 59% of American forests are privately owned, it's going to take a lot of private individuals, not just the national parks and the national forests and, and you know, conservation areas to actually, you know, get on the bandwagon to see that this tree is restored to its, um, its original range. So now let's talk about the impacts of American chestnut restoration, because I think 
Now, since the American chestnut is gone, I mean, none of us recognize a forest that is 25% American chestnut. So, you know, since that tree is gone, all of, all of the other trees uh, within its different parts of the range have, have filled that in. You know, we have red maple where there was once American chestnut. We have a lot of oaks where there were once American chestnut, certainly a lot of beech. And other places we have pines and, and, and other trees. So what could we learn, you know, from, from, you know, the possible restoration of this species that could lead to healthier forest and maybe restoration of other species? Well, first, remember this, you know, a healthy forest uh, you know, are, are, you know, they're dominated by a community of plants, animals and microorganisms, and they all interact with, with each other. You know, they interact with the soil, the water, and the climate. You know, one of the interesting things that I, that I saw just recently, and this was in the, uh, uh, you know, one of the publications that I received, but they were talking about carbon credits. And they said, you know, half of the carbon in a, in a forest is not stored in the trees, it's in the soil, in the roots. So, you know, uh, you know, a healthy forest, a healthy forest is a very complex thing. Diversity, we know, is a major component of, the, of forest health. Another thing about, you know, carbon, we know that a more diverse forest actually sequesters more carbon. And the reason for that is because you've got all these different shapes and sizes of, of trees, and, and some of them exist in the understory, and some of them are in the overstory. So, you know, you need that kind of diversity. Anytime that you lose a, a species, especially a dominant one, like the American chestnut, there is a cascading ecological effect. You know, it's, it's not just the animals that lose out, but a lot of, of other plants and, and, you know, parts of that, that community. Returning the American chestnut to the landscape, you know, it, it's gonna restore ecosystem function you know, that, that was once, once provided by this species. And so, you know, we need to look at that in terms of other trees too. When we lose that ash, you know, a lot of us look at that and we say, darn, we're losing our ash. Well, you know, there, there's another tree that's going to, uh, that's going to come in there and, and fill in, but there's a lot of other things that depend on that ash. You know, there are a lot of other animals and in, insects, quite frankly, that, that, uh, that depend on the, uh, on the ash. And so when you remove that ash, you end up influencing their life cycle and the life cycle of a lot of other things that depend on them. You lose the insects, you lose the birds. You know, the lessons that, that, we, that we learn from this effort to restore the American chestnut, uh, you know, we can definitely apply those to, to a lot of others. You know, I've got pictures up here. You see the gyps, you know, the gypsy moss and the the, uh, you know, laurel wild is down there, a thousand cankers, you know, for the, for the chestnuts. Um, Uli Adelgit, you know, <clears throat> there are so many, so many, uh, you know, threats to our, our forest. Uh, and, and we're not just talking about, you know, invasive species like, uh, you know, like Tree of Heaven and, and Polonia and, and uh, you know, all the multiflora rose and the, and the, the uh, honeysuckle that I deal with. So <clears throat> one of the important lessons is the importance of collaboration. And then you have to have a holistic approach. You know, when we put that chestnut back, we're not just growing a tree. You know, we, we are growing a tree that, that, that other members or other components of that forest will be influenced by. You know, so like I said, when they test that, that tree, that transgenic tree, you know, they wanna make sure that, that any part of that ecosystem that could be affected, whether it's a stream or an insect or things that live in the streams or, or things that feed on the insects, all of those things are, uh, are taken into account. So you've got to have that holistic approach. And then it really, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of collaboration to achieve something like this. That's why, you know, the, the uh, National Forest Service, you know, they have really been a, a terrific partner as well as the, as the Park Service. Uh, because a lot of those lands, you know, that, that are national parks and national forests, they're in the, in the, uh, the range, uh, you know, of the American chestnut. So, you know, uh, another, another thing that we need to realize is that, uh, you know, the necessity of using the best possible science. You know, it's always good to make a decision from an informed position. And, you know, the science allows us to do that. Uh, and then another thing is that if you really want to get something done, I don't care what it is, you have to be relentless. 
you have to be relentless. That's why, that's why I'm out spraying all the time, I guess. One final thought, and this is, this is from one of the uh, 19th century, um, this guy was an orator, he was, uh, he was a lot of things actually, a Freemason, but certainly an author and a poet. And he, uh, he wrote this, and I, I think, you know, certainly again, as Woodland owners, uh, you know, we, we need to think about this. And, and this is a lot of what, you know, when I, when I look at what I'm doing with the American chestnut, I will never see a forest that, that looks like the forest my grandfather saw or my great grandfather saw. That's, that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, my grandchildren will never see a forest like that. You know, we're never going to see a, a tree. You know, a chestnut is a long lived species, but you know, it's, it's not a redwood. Uh, but, you know, I'm never going to see a tree, you know, that's going to be 200 years old. You know, science will take us a long way, but I'll expect to live that long. And again, my grandkids are not going to see those trees. As a matter of fact, um, one of the, uh, uh, I guess, a granddaughter of uh, Pinchot, he, he or she recently said, you know, we'll never see that, that chestnut dominated forest uh, again, probably. And, and you know, that's, that, that's, that's a fact. But even knowing that, you know, I still, I'm a big chestnut enthusiast. I, I, I really am. And, uh, and you know, I, I kind of uh, look at it, I guess, like Albert Pike did. And, you know, so he, he wrote this. What we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is truly immortal. So I'll leave you with that thought. And then I want to I wanna tell you again, you know, these thoughts, many of them are not my own. These, these quotes, they're not original. You know, uh, this, is, this is from uh, a lot of the reading that I do and, and a lot of the research that I've done. Two of the books that, that I read just most recently, uh, Mighty Giants, I had read that first a couple of years ago, but I, I just recently reread that whole thing. And it is a wonderful work, wonderful work. Uh, there's a, a preface in there, by the way, by former President Jimmy Carter, who is a member of the American Chestnut Foundation. And, you know, he, he kind of gives us his recollection of the American chestnut. And then this other book, which, you know, this is a more recent uh, book, but Champion. Wow, that is a fantastic book. And it will tell you, it will give you the past, present, and, and you know, future of the American chestnut. Uh, and I certainly, I gleaned a lot of what I, uh, what I uh, you know, used to put this presentation together from that. But also the American Chestnut Foundation, you know, that's right up there at the top, their website, lots of, lots of information right there. You can also go to the Facebook page of, uh, of uh, a lot of the different chapters, the, you know, the, certainly the Kentucky chapter, uh, but there are, again, some, um, some circulars or publications that were put out by the National Park Service and, um, and the, uh, the uh, USDA or the, um, um, the uh, National Forestry. Um, as a matter of fact, one of these, I think it was the National Park Service uh, uh, bulletin that I looked at. Uh, they, they had a conference in Asheville, I believe it was in, uh, in 2000 and, and, uh, uh, 2007, maybe. Two, no, it was 2004. The, the publication was in 2006. And what, what that, that conference was about was, okay, do we want to put the American chestnut back? you know, in the forest, if we, if we do, you know, why would we want to do that? And, and how would we go about doing it? Where would we put it? Are we talking about demonstration plantings? You know, there's a lot of those throughout the, uh, the country. Are we talking about something much larger and, you know, something, you know, on a larger scale? And what would that, what would that look like? And how soon should we, should we uh, expect to do that? And at that time, you know, there, there was not, uh, we weren't near as far along as we are with, with, uh, with any of the programs. As a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, the National Forest, uh, we started planning out the, the back cross chestnuts in, in those locations in, in fairly large numbers, I believe in 2009. So uh, anyway, some, some excellent resources right there. And then I don't know if I can answer them, but uh, I know one question that'll come up right off the bat. If you're a chestnut enthusiast or if, you, if you've caught the bug now, you may say, so where do I get these? I, I see this on the internet all the time. And so, you know, there are, there are many sources for pure American seeds. Um, 
you know, the American, the uh, Maryland chapter does uh, pass out some about every year. And, you know, you, you plant these seeds with the understanding that, you know, a lot of these are there, you know, we hope that they, that they will uh, get large enough to, uh, to actually, uh, you know, cross pollinate with maybe another one or two that you've, uh, that you put out there and then you can collect the seed. But really a lot of it is just, uh, if you do, or if we do have the chance in the future, you'll understand um, something about growing, growing, you know, the, these chestnuts. And I'll tell you this from personal experience, uh, if you try to grow an Asian chestnut, you know, a Chinese chestnut, as we refer to them, and you try to grow an American, there's a difference. There is a huge difference. I grew some in a, in a greenhouse, and uh, the greenhouse got a little warm, uh, a little too warm one day, and I lost, I lost 90% of my American chestnut seedlings. Um, I even had some of the restoration chestnuts in there. And the only of six restoration chestnuts that I planted in there, those 15 sixteenths, the only one that survived was one that really, even though it was supposed to be a 15 sixteenth, the leaf looked more like a Chinese chestnut. And so um, again, learning, learning, uh, you know, how to raise these things is, is really, uh, uh, it, it, I think it's, a, it's an important, uh, you know, skill, skill to have. Right now, myself, I have, um, uh, I have seven chestnuts that uh, that I planted this uh, this winter in the greenhouse, um, and um, of uh, I actually planted ten nuts. Seven of them germinated. These are from New York, and they're pure Americans. And we're hoping to to uh, grow these trees out so that they can become mother trees. And then I have uh, I have fifteen nuts that I got from uh, over in Western Kentucky. If you want to get get pure Americans. Uh, chestnuts to plant there is a uh, a man he calls himself the mater maker over around bowling green um i actually i believe he lives in 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 scottsville now but uh, uh you can get seeds from him and he has a couple different sources he found a uh, a surviving american chestnut in um in north carolina and he collected some of the seeds with permission brought those back and he's been growing those and i i i recently planted 15 of those as well so and i've got um I probably got two dozen or more of the uh, of the fifteen sixteenths, uh, and that's besides those that are growing on on my property right now. So you know, I've I've been looking at this for for quite some time, and again, you know, I, I probably put a lot more effort into it than uh, than uh, than you might be willing to. But it it's a it's a great hobby. It's a great hobby. So I think that's where I'll leave the uh, I'll leave the uh, the presentation. I, I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that you uh, that you learned something from it. Well, Jimmy, personally, I really appreciated it. I thought you did a great job. Thank yeah. you very much. You're very welcome. Yep. Jimmy, are the books that you mentioned, Giant, uh, Mighty Giants and Champion, I didn't see those uh, listed in the text. Well, uh, I, no, all I did was I, I showed you the picture of those books. I didn't put up an ISBN or anything like that. I, I kind of believe a picture, you know, is worth a thousand words. <laughs> okay. That's, that, that, that's what they look like. I mean, I use that yeah. for my reference. It was, it was not, um, I didn't reference those things, you know, in any kind of, uh, uh, you know, actual format. I, you know, I, I could have done that. I would have had to, had to go back. You know, I've been out of school a while now. <laughs> <laughs> you did a pretty good job. Yeah. I, I, I haven't written a term paper in quite a while. And, and, and since then, you know, we have all these uh, internet sources and I, I'd have a hard time. If, if this was actually an official document, I'd have, I'd have to spend some time back in the books on it. <laughs> oh, it's good content. Of, uh, Karen is always looking for a good book to do a book review or, or get a book review from somebody. And I thought that might be something. Well, you know, since you just reread it, Jimmy, not to give you another assignment, but it might be easy to pop off a few words about it. Okay. I, you, I'll tell you, I think that uh, the one that most people, uh, you know, the mighty giant is a wonderful and that, that was actually, uh, um, I think it was published on the 30th anniversary, I believe of, of the American chestnut foundation. But um, uh, I, I really enjoy Champion, and Champion is, is much, much more current now. 
And there, there's just a lot, there was a lot of good information in that. And I, I think I could probably do a, a short review on that for you. And that, that one, I, I would highly recommend any of them. And there are others, I mean, you, you can just do a search, you know, a Google search and, um, and you'll, you'll find lots of books, but uh, those, are, those are my two favorites. Okay. You know, while we're, while we're waiting for some other questions to come in, I'd like to give a shout out to Steve. Steve, a um, great idea to try to offer this up as a um, service to Kentucky Woodland owners here in the state. Um, appreciate your um, interest and efforts in trying to get this going. Thank you. And we're going to do Ellen Crocker in May. And uh, we may be doing carbon credits soon after that. All right. Sounds good. Well, I'm glad I didn't have to follow Ellen. I'm glad well, I got out ahead of that. <laughs> oh, uh, Ellen's way, pretty the strong. Picture, <laughs> the picture right there, of course, you see I'm.